Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you who, who are here today and all of those who are tuning in at, in their homes to participate in Project Teach and our Project Teach Solutions session today. My name is Nithya Chari Harris, and I'm a director of the Coexisting with Carnivores Alliance. Project TEACH stands for Talking About Ecology and Aims for Conserving Habitat. It's a collaborative educational initiative aimed at exploring the landscape level impacts of human decision making. It was conceived of and implemented by the Rain Coast Foundation and the Coexisting with Carnivores Alliance with significant support from the Wildlife Coexistence Lab of UBC and the Applied Conservation Science Lab of UVic. Between May 12th and June 9th, our group of collaborators hosted weekly seminars. Each episode focused on a different theme and featured a panel of three experts. The themes explored were connecting over carnivores, the role of, carnivore, the role of carnivores in maintaining climate stability in coastal BC, fungi and plant diversity, maintaining abundance in coastal forests, fostering forest resilience in the climate change era, connectivity conservation, recreation and conservation, the balancing act. I found them amazing that the experts that we had there were, had so much to tell us. How many people here attended uh, one or many of those? Just put your hands up. Yeah, pretty, pretty amazing stuff. I know that um, for those of you who did not uh, attend those, I encourage you to uh, watch the recordings and they're available at the Rain Coast website. And uh, I know that I'm going to watch them again because the information is quite amazing. This solution session has been designed to mobilize the information shared during those webinar episodes. Today, we will explore pathways for developing stronger environmental protection within the coastal Douglas fir biogeoclimatic bio zone and the neighboring western hemlock zone and beyond. We hope that this project will empower attendees, all of you, to participate in local decision making and provide policymakers with ne necessary information to create a culture of conservation. Our project partners have been working together to encourage this culture. We will start today with presentations and a panel discussion featuring Lauren, Lauren Eckert, PhD student from the Applied Conservation Science Lab here at UVic, and Deborah Kern, Executive Director from the Environmental Law Center. Chief Gordon Planis was also meant to be here today, but unfortunately could not join us. Following the panel discussion, we will split out into breakout groups to brainstorm options for strengthening local environmental protection policies. Folks tuning in at home will be able to participate in similar discussions in Zoom breakout sessions. The idea shared during that portion of today's program will be synthesized into a final report which our project partners will then distribute to local policymakers. Shauna, can you come in and talk about the housekeeping? Hi, everybody. So just a few things to address before we get started. Uh, it's important to note that we are live streaming today's session, so just be mindful that there are cameras that are uh, filming this. Um, so if you're in this front row here, if you're going to stand up, you might block a camera, so just maybe duck. Um, there are breaks scheduled between each segment today, so you have uh, plenty of time to take bio breaks or maybe go and uh, graze at the snack table. There is so much food back there, so please uh, help yourself. And there's also washrooms just to the left of the doors over there if uh, you need that. Um, finally, uh, I've been handing out tickets. There's going to be a draw for the a prize at the end of today's session for those who stick with us to the end. Uh, if you haven't received a ticket, please come and see me at some point today and I'll give you one. Um, so with that behind us, um, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement, expressing our gratitude and appreciation to be here on the unceded ancestral territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasainich nations. We would also like to recognize the neighboring Souk, Pachidat, and Sikanu nations, and the dozens of distinct Coast Salish and New Chalinoth nations on whose territory many of us attending today have the privilege of being grateful guests. Uh, online guests, I encourage you to recognize the nations on whose territory you reside in the Zoom chat box. 
Uh, in the interest of translating this, uh, wor these words of acknowledgement into action, I would like to share a few words written by Tiffany Joseph, a Wasainich, Squamish, and Quetzin writer, educator, and knowledge holder. She recently wrote an article for Raincoast Conservation Foundation, and I think this is a really important lesson for us all to keep in mind as we move through our lives. Many settlers are not looking at truth, they just want to reconcile. There's fear about facing the truth because it can bring us feelings of shame and guilt. But when we allow time and space for looking at the true history of Canada and our ancestors' roles in colonization, it gives us a chance to evolve perspectives and recognize internal beliefs and prejudices that need to be transformed. In many Coast Salish languages, there is no word for sorry. All you can do is change your behavior. So at the end of the day, we can apologize all we want, but the only true apology is changing our behavior. Thanks, Shana. And now it's my pleasure to, in to invite our MC for the afternoon, Andy McKinnon, on the stage to get us started. Andy really needs no introduction, but I will give him one anyways. He has worked for 30 years as, as an ecologist with the research branch of the UBC Ministry of Forests, Lands and Natural Resources. His graduate research was in mycology, and he is the co-author of six guidebooks to BC's plants and mushrooms. Um, his graduate research was in mycology, and he's a co-author of, did I talk about that already? I might have, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> he's a retired professional forester and a professional biologist. He has served as an elected counselor in Machosan since 2014. Other roles he occupies are the chair of Machosan Finance and Environment Standing Committee, council liaison to Machosan Environmental Advisory Select Committee, and board member of the Greater Victoria Public Library. He also contributes to work done by the CRD Climate Action Intermunicipal Task Force Committee, Capital Region Invasive Species Partnership, the Chosen Hall Society, and the Beecher Bay Siano First Nation. Welcome, Andy. Thanks so much, Nitya, and thank you so much for the invitation to join you here today. I was very excited to be invited to take part in Project TEACH. There are a lot of wonderful people involved in organizing and putting on these events. And the sessions that have been held so far have been extraordinary, the, the uh, people who have agreed to take part in them. I'm excited both as a, a resident of this part of the world, as a biologist, who did spend a lot of time mapping ecosystems, studying plants and fungi, and, and has a good appreciation of the fact that we live in uh, what is in British Columbia, the ecological zone with the least amount of old growth forest left, the ecological zone with the highest percentage of agriculture and urban land of any ecological zone, the ecological zone with the highest percentage of private land, and as a consequence of all of the aforementioned, the ecological zone that's got the, the largest number of threatened and endangered species and ecosystems per area of any in British Columbia. There are huge conservation challenges here. So I approach it with an appreciation of that, but I also approach it today as a municipal councillor in Machosan of eight years. And I know that one of the goals of Project TEACH is to bring together the lessons from the, the workshops held so far, as well as all of the valuable insights that we'll gather here today, and put those together into documents with recommendations for municipal government and regional district government, uh, who are the levels of government that will make a lot of the important decisions about what happens in the coastal Douglas fir zone. So speaking also as a municipal councillor, thank you for all of your efforts in that regard. Uh, it's my great pleasure this morning, this afternoon, pardon me, to introduce uh, Deborah Curran. Uh, Deborah is associated with both the Faculty of Law and the School of Environmental Studies in the Faculty of Social Sciences at University of Victoria. She teaches in the areas of land and water regulation and law, including water law, 
Municipal Law, and the Environmental Law Clinic Intensive Course. As the Executive Director with the Environmental Law Center at the University of Victoria, it doesn't say this, but it should say the Environmental Law Center, which does so much good work that is avidly followed by myself and a lot of other municipal officials. Uh, she supervises students working on environmental law projects for community organization and First Nations clients. All Deborah's courses explore how colonial law interacts with or has an impact on Indigenous laws and community. Please welcome Deborah Curran. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be speaking with you today about uh, sort of the accumulation of 25 years of experience uh, yelling at local governments here in British Columbia on the one hand, working with them on the other hand to improve their bylaws, and then also providing resources to community organizations so that they can themselves uh, advocate on their own behalf around conservation. And our thinking over that 25 years has evolved pretty significantly. And so you'll see in, I'm gonna speak through the lens of the Green Bylaws Toolkit, the third edition. And we have not some new concepts in there, but I think what you'll find in, you know, if you compare the first edition to the third, which you would never wanna do is that in the first edition, we were simply looking at protecting some remnant landscape or elements of landscape such that we had some ecology throughout our private lands. But now we really recognize, or we've taken into account a lot more, all of the conservation science that you have been hearing about during Project Teach, and it's woven in much more through the way that we talk about what is a package of green bylaws, or what does a conservation approach look like at a municipal scale and through municipal jurisdiction. So you'll see concepts of connectivity, you'll see concepts of you know, total uh, landscape preservation in the sense of like what is our ecosystem function or biodiversity that we're trying to get back to. We also have a lot more focus on restoration. And so before it was always protection. And we know that we've just, in, especially in private land, we simply continue to whittle away at those, those landscapes, as Andy said, that are the most endangered in British Columbia. And so we're now talking restoration. So we're anticipating that what doesn't look uh, ecologically valuable in a connected way across our landscapes right now will be in the next 250 years restored to that. The, the final thing I'll say, just in some uh, parts of context, is that we need to take some of the learnings from our very large scale successes in BC around conservation. So I'll point to, and there's problems with each of them, so these are just illustrative, is the, you know, the ecosystem-based standards set somewhere like the Great Bear Rainforest, where the agreement between the province and the nations is to restore that landscape to uh, old growth status over a 250 year time frame. And we need exactly those kinds of ecological markers, both in time and scale, for our, throughout our regional jurisdictions, and then for those to then come down to our uh, municipal jurisdictions. So what I'm gonna do today is just to introduce you to some of the ideas through the green, of the Green Bylaws Toolkit that you can actually find in the toolkit itself, but add a little bit more of my own commentary um, from the last 25 years um, in what we've been doing around Green Bylaws. I'd also like to also just give a little bit of context around what are municipal or local government responsibilities in this era of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the provincial government's commitment through the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act to bringing laws in British Columbia uh, into consistency with the UN Declaration. I'll just touch on that, but I'm happy to do, do a deeper dive in the question and answer. Okay, so we talk in the language of green infrastructure now. So it's not just protecting natural areas, whatever those are. Local governments talk about infrastructure, and so we see green infrastructure, which are all of those elements of ecosystems that uh, interact with us as humans. So I'm not talking just 
value to a local government or value to humans. They exist in and of themselves. But it can be manufactured, it can be green roofs, and it can also be parks and protected areas that are very ecologically central to our uh, communities. So connected green infrastructure. And what I, I, have, I have used this slide for 20 years, and it's essentially the entire jurisdiction of local governments to protect the environment. So everything from tree bylaws to regional growth strategies to subdivision. And you can see that there's a lot of individual authorities for local governments under two different acts, the Local Government Act and the Community Charter. And you'll notice two things. Number one, there's a lot of authority there. So in my view, there isn't a single local government that comes close to using all of the th authority that they have to do green bylaws or to uh, connect and conserve important ecological spaces. So that's the first observation. The second one is, these are all in silos. You can see that you do a tree bylaw over here, you do your watercourse protection bylaw over here, and we need to think in a much more integrated way as the environment doesn't respect that kind of jurisdictional uh, boundaries. So this is just an overview of all of the chapters in the Green Bylaws Toolkit. I encourage you to delve into it further. And what it is, is it goes from sort of the macro scale regional growth strategies and OCPs all the way down to covenants and um, you know individual types of bylaws like tree protection bylaws. So it just gives you an overview of best practices and then some example sample bylaws in there that you can apply to your own community. And just a couple of uh, just a couple of comments about local government jurisdiction. So best practices for a successful approach to green bylaws. Look at this. I'm getting old, and I should have brought glasses, which I don't have. It's just a recent change. Uh, we're talking much more about a nested approach to conservation. So rather than just focusing on a tree bylaw, first we need to ask ourselves what are the other overarching plans and policy statements that then support a tree bylaw. Because if we don't have that overarching community vision and process, what happens is then uh, private landowners will kick out individual moments of conservation, <clears throat> like we saw in Saanich with the environmental development permit area, the upland portion of it. And so we have to have that nested approach to green bylaws. And so we look at planning and strategies, we look at bylaws, and then we also look at community support. So there's a public education component to it that, as Nitya said, we need to create the culture of conservation and keep that going. We can't take it for granted. So we focus on ecological health at all scales and really integrate uh, performance-based measures throughout um, our bylaws and our plans. So just a couple of comments about this, uh, the new focus in British Columbia on uh, Indigenous authority. So as you know, Indigenous authority has always operated and exists and has life and moves and changes, whether or not we as settlers, most of us can access it. And in this new turn in terms of provincial government, federal government acknowledgement of that Indigenous authority and Indigenous legal orders. We have the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that says we will align BC laws with the UN Declaration. And I would encourage everyone, if you haven't, just go and have a read of the Declaration. It's not that long. But it says things like Indigenous people have the right to have a say and give consent to activities in their lands through their own processes. So not by processes that are defined by federal governments or by local governments, but by their own processes. And so it explicitly has a collaborative governance approach uh, sort of built into it. And yeah, this alignment of laws, if you, pick, if you take a very pointy-headed legal approach in colonial law and you look at the Interpretation Act of BC, you'll see that laws include regulations which include bylaws. So in colonial law already, law is acknowledged to be a municipal bylaw, and therefore over time, bylaws need to be brought into consistency with the UN Declaration, ultimately at the end of the day. So even though there is no duty to consult, at least 
Colonial courts have found there's no duty to consult on the part of local governments with Indigenous communities. That rests on the provincial and federal governments. There's a new provincial mechanism under the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that there should be some alignment. So it's up to local governments to take that seriously and say, what does that mean to us in collaboration with and in conversation with the Indigenous communities on whose territories they operate? So this is a new uh, development in the way in which Crown governments are thinking about relationships and hopefully in the next five years we'll see a lot of interesting uh, development in that way. So the first concept that I've already mentioned that I want to say a few things about is connectivity. So we have often simply protected areas, so we'll protect parks, or we'll protect riparian areas, which is also connectivity, but we haven't considered them, we haven't, local governments typically have not looked at their entire jurisdictional boundaries and said, okay, what is the ecological connectivity throughout our entire land and waterscape such that we know we're going to have functioning ecology, either preserve it or restore it over the next hundred years. And so there are lots of components to this approach to taking a connectivity approach to green bylaws around mapping, uh, designation of corridors through plans and bylaws, and uh, making commitments for acquiring green infrastructure. An example of this is in the Okanagan. So the Okanagan Conservation, uh, Collaborative Conservation Partnership has worked with a regional district and a couple of municipalities to create the Okanagan Wildlife Corridor that goes through several local government jurisdictions. And the intent then is to, over time, to maintain that corridor and to restore it so that it does, in fact, provide a north-south um, corridor for wildlife throughout a very endangered ecosystem. Uh, Cumberland, so if you want a small community example, the municipality of Cumberland has designated its entire landscape within an environmental development permit area uh, environmental DPA and all of the green that you see is connectivity area. So they very explicitly note un any undeveloped areas for connectivity and then that invites a conversation about as development occurs over time and the status of land changes, then that is um, up for conversation about how that maintains that connectivity beyond riparian areas. Uh, likewise, this Surrey has a very well-mapped green infrastructure network and they started out with their biodiversity strategy and from that then they developed the green infrastructure network that then uh, very explicitly talks about where that important green infrastructure is and because they're a highly urbanizing uh, municipality, they're one of the fastest growing in BC, they then have goals for purchasing a lot of the key connectivity areas to maintain them over time. So we see really connectivity, again, needs a nested approach. You go from strategies and plans to bylaws and then to on the ground individual property approaches like zoning and regulatory uh, tools, such environmental development permit areas. The next uh, key, I guess, value or approach would be to take a systems approach to green bylaws. And what we mean by that is looking at ecological systems, so getting away from the siloing of the approach to environmental protection or restoration through individual bylaws and to say, okay, water, groundwater, our riparian areas, what are the totality of approaches that we need in order to ensure connectivity at various uh, temporal and, um, and spatial scales. So we're looking at primarily things like water quality and quantity, air quality, and uh, biodiversity would be another system as well. So obviously we can't engineer our way out of climate impacts. And so what are then the natural or green infrastructure, the natural systems approaches to uh, being able to deal with climate events in a more holistic way? So the Central Okanagan Regional District has interesting aquatic ecosystem development permit guidelines that are quite detailed and require an environmental impact assessment. And if you don't, if you choose not to build in the riparian area, then you avoid this quite enhanced over the riparian areas 
protection regulation kind of approach. So they have um, a much more detailed approach to it, uh, not only to protect ecosystems, but to give the message to landowners that really there should be no development within those areas. Kelowna's Mission Creek Restoration Initiative is very interesting because they came to the conclusion about a decade ago that they've simply over uh, urbanized Mission Creek. They can't deal with the flooding and so they're actually restoring it by purchasing key pieces of land to turn back into wetland and to re-complex Mission Creek so that the flooding is dealt with in a more natural way than what it is at this point in time which is to flood uh, in the downtown core, all of the uh, apartment buildings and other properties down there. Uh, likewise, the City of Maple Ridge Watercourse Protection uh, Bylaw is another interesting example that brings about connectivity and a systems approach. So what we really need then is a nested and connected web of plans and bylaws that are pointing to long-term ecological health and we've defined what those ecological health measures are out into the future in terms of biodiversity goals, uh, percentage of, um, of different types of ecosystems protected or restoration metrics. The final one is uh, scale. And so as you can, un you're probably getting the sense that I'm really talking about green bylaws approach operates at all scales. So from a regional scale down to the application at an individual property level. And it really is nested throughout the scaffolding of local governments. So from plans to bylaws and to policies and through public education. And it's really only that kind of approach that allows a green bylaws approach or a green infrastructure approach to carry on into the future. Because if you only nest it in policy, or in an official community plan, it won't land when a regulatory bylaw decision is being made at a property specific level. Likewise, if you nest it only in a tree bylaw, then it will be either opposed by individual property owners uh, when th that bylaw is applied to them, or it won't have, it won't be reflected in the longer term vision for um, the community itself. So in conclusion, we really need to pay attention to overall maintaining or promoting or creating this culture of conservation. And here in the capital region in particular, we really do have elements of that through many of our local governments. So we can certainly point to Machosen, point to the district of Saanich and others for interesting policies being leaders on uh, protecting and conserving ecosystems, but not quite there in a, a coherent or a, in a comprehensive way. And so there's lots that we can do to improve on that. So we really need to have a whole uh, municipal approach, the bylaw and policy framework that is connected and very much reflects a long-term vision of who we want to be in 100 years in terms of ecological health and how we're going to get there. So measurable metrics that we can work towards throughout all of our landscape. So public lands as well as private lands. And I think that's it for me. This is the, the, the Green Bylaws Toolkit is slightly hard to find at this point in time. So I would encourage you, this is the URL for it. If you, if you search it, make sure that you come across the, um, the 2021 version. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deborah. I was uh, telling Deborah I was actually consulting the Green Bylaws Toolkit uh, last night, coincidentally, uh, as part of uh, uh, revisions to Machosen's tree management bylaw. So I highly recommend the, the toolkit. Our next speaker is Lauren Eckert. Lauren is a conservation scientist, PhD candidate, and a Canada Vanier Scholar at the University of Victoria, in addition to being a Rain Coast Conservation Fellow and a National Geographic Explorer. So cool. Uh, her early research experiences around the globe exposed Lauren to the complexities of interrelated social and ecological systems 
and motivated her to delve into conservation science that recognizes humans' important role in global ecosystems, engages communities directly in conservation, and supports Indigenous nations and individuals reasserting their knowledge and rights. Her MSc work at the University of Victoria bridged Indigenous knowledge and ecological science through a community-engaged, Indigenous-led approach to conservation in partnership with the Central Coast First Nations in their territories. Lauren began her PhD in 2017, and her current research interests include the intersections of Indigenous and Western sciences, Canadian environmental policy, and the role human values play in our relationships with wildlife, and ultimately, conservation conflicts and collaborative ways to transform them. Lauren is also an artist, a dog mum, and the so-called honorary auntie of the Centre for Indigenous Fisheries at the University of British Columbia. Lauren? going to follow Deb's lead here, I think, in grabbing this. That seems way more casual. Awesome. Okay, let's see if my clicker is working too. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much, Andy. And for everyone who's made this possible, Shauna and Chris Genovali at Raincoast, for UVic, UBC, Cole and his team, and to Nitya and coexisting with carnivores. I am thrilled to be here today to share a high-level glimpse into my doctoral research. Uh, and how I think that may apply to the discussions we'll have today and to policy more generally. Uh, and I'm also really humbled to be here today. It's been a really incredible five weeks of hearing from inspiring experts doing applied research in areas I think we all care a lot about. I wish Chief Plains could be here today with us. You're here! Oh my gosh! <laughs> So do we have time for, for, wonderful. I'm so thrilled. Okay, that was going to be a big gap, I think, in the panel and conversation. So what a wonderful thing. Welcome. Um, so yeah, I am going to talk more generally. I'm going to sort of take a step back and talk about, rather than specific policies, frameworks for thinking about policies, the upstream impacts of how we get to policy decisions, what we do when we disagree about policies, and more. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a conservation scientist, which I feel like is a little bit of a cop-out way for me to be in the natural sciences and the social sciences and uh, have a bit of a scientist identity crisis, but fit it all under one title. And thanks everyone online and in person for being here on this sunny, beautiful day, one of the first of summer, both by date and by temperature. So I'm grateful that you're taking this time today to be here. And so for those of you who have been able to join for the, for, uh, the expert virtual series, uh, I just want to take a moment to situate us and what we've learned so far. And this image up on screen is from Métis visual artist Christy Belcourt, whose work I highly recommend checking out. And Christy is a Métis visual artist who uses pointillism in her paintings and artwork as both cultural homage to uh, her peoples and communities, but also in the style of traditional beadwork uh, to express the complicated interconnectivity of people, landscapes, and all of those beings within them. And I thought this well represented the intersections that have come up in the conversations that have happened so far uh, uh, across the experts that have joined us. So we've together learned about the importance of all sorts of species to humans and non-human animals in the ecosystems which we call home, the connections between those marine animals and terrestrial relatives, We've talked about and learned about carnivores, our relationships to them, coexisting with them, and also what role they play in ecosystems and climate and our lives more broadly. We've also learned a ton about the complexity of mushrooms and trees and the soil systems that support them and their interconnection 
to all sorts of animals. And finally, we've talked about the human element, about recreation, about decision-making, policy, connectivity. And so it's from here that we begin to talk broadly today about solutions and policy. Before I get into talking about my thesis, I, I want to acknowledge where I am, both geographically and beyond. And uh, it was a wonderful introduction. And I also want to mention that I call home both Victoria, so Likwagen speaking people's territory, and I've been at the University of Victoria for eight years now, uh, but also that I am a visitor on Tla'aman Nation territory, modern day Lund on the Sunshine Coast of BC. And I'm lucky to call that place home. And I also want to situate myself further. So in addition to being a conservation scientist and a PhD student, I'm an auntie, I am a friend, a partner, a sister, a daughter, and I am a settler of, of uh, European descent. And my journey to conservation began in coastal California where I was born, but then moved to the plains of Northwestern Iowa. And it was traveling back and forth in that portion of the world that I fell in love with everything about our natural world, the diversity of the ecosystems we can cross in such ultimately a small geographical place. And so that those dimensions of my being are sort of what shaped me in that all together is the positionality from which I can come to my science, come to this discussion today with you all. And also, and i um, grateful to Shauna for what she shared after the territorial acknowledgements in terms of action items, specifically for settlers, settler descended folks in the audience. But it is the privilege, the aspects of my positionality from which I reap privilege that are at the cost of violent colonization historically and today uh, that indigenous peoples face from which a responsibility to act differently in the world and to attend to the relationships and the damage that has been done that I feel is um, very much as I learn and grow become part of my conservation journey. So throughout my career as a, a graduate student here at UVic and long before, <clears throat> excuse me, I have had the wonderful ability to listen to uh, nations, listen to governments, indigenous and non-indigenous, and listen to all sorts of individuals involved in conversation, decisions and discussions, come face to face with conflict. Conflict, I'm sure you are all familiar with, is a challenging and uh, important aspect of being a human and beyond being a human. Conflict exists for all living things. And today I'm going to talk about conservation conflict. I'm going to walk through very quickly and broadly three examples of conservation conflict and hopefully provide a um, alternative to thinking about conflict that can support our processes towards policy solutions and towards relationship building. So I'm sure you're all well familiar with conservation conflicts. And what I wanna focus on here, rather than providing academic uh, definitions, is to focus on the fact that much like any other personal conflict we experience in our life, conservation conflicts aren't always about the superficial visual aspect that they're presenting. So think about your most recent interpersonal conflict. Maybe it was over something you know, seemingly small, like a dirty dish left in the sink, perhaps one too many times, that results in this uh, blow up with someone you care deeply about, what's being represented and the conflict that follows isn't probably the one dirty dish in the sink, but rather a cascade of unresolved emotions and histories and conversation that then come to the fore using that object of the cup. And similarly, conflicts over conservation, while they may appear to be about a bylaw or a private property decision or how to manage a local species of concern, when conflicts emerge around those decisions, of course, they're often about much deeper and harder to solve things like who we are and what our responsibility to the more than human world is. And the framework through which I'm going to talk about these conflicts today is a social theory from the Western sciences 
called Conservation Conflict Transformation. This is a new theory. It has been practiced in more than Western spaces for tens of thousands of years. But what conservation conflict transformation asks us to do is look deeply at conflict and see it not as a problem, but as an opportunity, an invitation in to assess what is wrong and how we have to attend to it at the relationship and foundational level beyond just talking about the visual policy decision. And we're likely all familiar with what these conflicts might look like in the conservation space. So for instance, conflicts may emerge over how to manage iconic species around which there are entrenched disagreements, like wolves, and Yellowstone being a great case study, but other case studies emerging from the Capital Regional District, as many of you I'm sure are familiar with. We also have conflict with wildlife directly. So here's an image showing how human infrastructure and human themselves are coming into conflict with an elephant, but we may know examples of this in the form of black bears, coyotes, even raccoons. Our relationships with other animals can often be conflict-oriented. And finally, we can come into conflict over so-called resources, you know, what to do with and how to manage the fish that communities and people rely on to eat, but also of themselves, you know, have a right to exist of their own volition. And so stepping back for a second, Deborah mentioned uh, environmental assessment processes. I'm going to talk about these at the federal level. And at their basic uh, portrayal, these, these processes are top-down federal decisions about the environment and specifically about large-scale projects and whether they will move forward or not. And I can get into the weeds here, but I'll save that for later. And this was the first spot of conflict I thought about in beginning my PhD. We can all probably think of examples of social conflict sparked by environmental assessment decisions. And environmental assessments have many consequences. You know, wildlife habitat can be fragmented, and there can be increases in human-caused wildlife mortality, and we can get these large landscape-scale changes that span provinces, communities, territories. And also this can result in social conflict as the colonial nation state, the federal government of Canada, imposes their federal environmental decisions on sovereign nations with their own decision-making processes and their own governing bodies. And juxtaposing these colonial Canadian environmental assessment processes are pre-existing Indigenous-led environmental assessment processes. So as Deborah mentioned, there are nations with their own authorities to make decisions in their territories as recognized by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And the space where top-down federal uh, environmental assessment decisions meet indigenous environmental assessment decisions often spark conflict. So with wonderful uh, team of, of academics and legal experts and co-led by uh, former SEO chief and UVic professor Nick Claxton, we took a look at the depths of this conflict. So rather than looking at, which is valid too, the consequences of a single project and how it rolls off across the landscape, we considered the newest Environmental Assessment Act in Canada and the layers upon which it relates to and fails to reckon with relationships with Indigenous knowledge. And so I'm going to sort of skip over this rather than getting into the weeds, but what we learned through looking at environmental assessments and many reviews of environmental assessment processes in the past is that there are superficial problems related to this process and its relationship with Indigenous nations, and those include resource limitations and procedural challenges. And then there are more deeply rooted obstacles to aligning Indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge in environmental assessments. These are legal obstacles and political obstacles. And finally, there's the really deep-rooted stuff that requires action, time, and a lot of people at the table. And, and these are historical obstacles and epistemological or knowledge-based obstacles. Moving on to another form of conflict, breezing through. We can also come into 
consequential moments of conflict over how to manage species we all care about. This is ongoing research analyzing conflict between so-called stakeholder groups, not indigenous stakeholder groups, in the context of salmon and southern resident killer whale management. So conflicts over management decisions can often play out at this group identity level. And in this case, in the land surrounding the Salish Sea on the Canada side of the modern day border, we have southern resident killer whales, culturally and genetically distinct whales that are very much important economically, ecologically, and culturally to the people of BC. And then we have Chinook salmon, which are the largest of Pacific salmon, managed mainly by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, but since time immemorial and today by nations of the now so-called Salish Sea. And because of the many multiplicative and intersecting threats to southern resident killer whales, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, to help in protecting killer whales, has limited the recreational fishing of Chinook salmon. This has resulted in tense conflict over many years between so-called recreational fishing groups, again, settler non-Indigenous fishing groups, privilege holders, and so-called conservation supporters. So those who support the limiting of Chinook fisheries for the benefit of killer whales or orcas. To look at this conflict at a deeper level, to apply a transformation approach, we dug deep using surveys and conversations with people in these two supposedly distinct groups to understand better their identities, their beliefs, their values, and their opinions about these management decisions. So asking the question, you know, is this conflict really about how many fish can come out of the water per year, or is this about much more and much deeper things than that? And what we learn first and foremost is that the binary distinction between recreational fishers and conservation supporters doesn't stand up. There's a lot of complexity and a lot of people identify as both of those things. There's overlap between these supposedly distinct groups. But we also found that there was lots of invisible uh, aspects of the conflict beyond just conflict over these protection measures. We found that there were unresolved history of conflict between these two so-called groups and their competing interests, that there was real sense of uh, vulnerability of power imbalances in the decision-making processes. We found at the most deep-rooted levels that were, there was real conflict expressed from uh, the settlers involved in this discussion about the identity of British Columbia and their relation to it. Who are we without southern resident killer whales? Who are we without Chinook? Who are we without fishing? These are things that there was not agreement over, unsurprisingly. And so these are some of the discussions we need to be having, conflict over these core management priorities and beliefs, rather than conflict over the superficial. And this includes conflict over things like identity, which, fascinatingly enough, humans experience in our bodies threats to our identity, these abstract threats, the same way we experience physical threats, like a predator standing in front of us. That cascade of stress hormones and emotion is paralleled. And so recommendations for policymakers when dealing with conflict over their policy decisions include starting with, before talking about you know, these high level decisions, humanizing the other group, building trust-based relationships between those whose interests may be in conflict with each other. Lots of peer reviewed research shows that attending to these relationships and attending to historical or unrelated concerns can actually lead to better agreements and compromise at this top level of conflict where we can then come together to have respectful conversations over disagreements. Finally, and I'll go over this quickly so we still have time for Chief Plains, uh, I study conflict between people and black bears, both in the Capital Regional District, building on Joanna Cleese Van Bommel's work, 
Uh, and additionally, I uh, work in the Katet Regional District, where I call home, Tla'aman Territory in Lund and Power River, British Columbia. And I don't think this needs any introduction. Many of you are probably very familiar with the challenge of relationships between people and our uh, Ursain neighbors. So we often think about, like I've mentioned, there's a through line, the proximate causes of conflict in these spaces. So the behavior by both people and bears that leads to conflict. But we can also look at this conflict on a deeper level. And that deeper level includes all sorts of social dimensions that lead to human behavior. You know, our trust in authorities, our values, our past experiences, and our beliefs. And on the bare sides of things, they are also individuals involved in this conflict, and there are social and ecological dimensions that drive bare behavior as well. Some of those dimensions relate to local bylaws and how uh, attractants are you know, set forth in bear's habitat. And so I have had the wonderful opportunity to study these relationships in this conflict using both ecological tools and wildlife cameras and social tools, talking to people and engaging in surveys. And the idea as I move forward in this side of conflict research is to understand that this map here shows conflict hotspots in the Katet Regional District. All you need to focus on is that the red squares are where conflict is most frequent. And what we want to understand through talking to people and learning about bears is are, what best predicts these conflict hotspots. Is it something as you know, relatively simple as where attractants like garbage are? Is it something deeper, like human beliefs, human past experiences, human values? Or is it on the ecological side of things, you know, for bears? So we're building towards a spatial statistical model uh, that helps us understand conflict and this landscape, but also its deep roots in people and bears with the hope being that we can thus implement changes, use our limited resources in those areas of high conflict, knowing what drives it towards coexistence. Uh, I feel I've taken way too much time, so I'll just wrap here really quickly by saying we can think of conflict then in the context of policy making, decisions and solutions that we'll talk about together as stinging nettle where we have at the surface of the conflict uh, a lot that is visible to us and things that can cause pain, you know, actions, words, and harm. On the stem of the conflict, we have these histories of unresolved conflict and misunderstanding that supports it. But if we can attend to these conflicts at their roots, where we can begin and attend to these values, beliefs, identities, and humanization, we may have opportunity to move forward and resolve those superficial challenges. And so with that, I wanna thank you all for your time today and recognize there's much I don't know. I'm always uncomfortable with the world expert, but I'm looking forward to the panel and talking more. And also finish by, you know, recognizing that this transformative approach calls us to move beyond hierarchical language, hierarchical beliefs. Uh, Giselle Maria Martin, in her talk for uh, the, the earlier session of Project Teach, shared insight into the fact that we need to broaden our understanding of each other to humanize each other, including our non-human relatives. Uh, so with that, I thank you very much. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Chief Gordon Planis, who is here to, be, to speak to us next. Uh, Chief Gordon Planis, his tradition name is, I'm sorry if I'm messing this up, Hai Kwacha, does that sound good? Close enough? Uh, named after his great grandfather from the Sianu Nation, Sianu, the Salmon people. Elected Chief of the Sauk Nation since 2008, Chief Planas previously held a position as the Backcountry Operations Manager of the West Coast Trail for Parks Canada. He's a Coast Salish carver, artist, artist, traditional singer, and captain of the South Traditional Dugout Canoes for the last two decades. Chief Planas has previously taken a three-year assignment in working with this community to bringing back their northern straits, the Sankotan language, and he lives in, in the 
in the village of Siosin and have six children and seven grandchildren. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit personally about um, my dealings with Chief Planners. I, and I'm going to take this couple of minutes that I have here to make a plug-in for a project that I'm working on. Sorry about this. It's not in the, in the schedule, but I can't help myself. Um, we're working on this amazing project. I know Deborah was talking about connectivity and how important it is this is. And we are working on a, on a project to connect Vancouver Island tip to tip. So the idea is to find ways to connect all these patches of important uh, lands that are already in, already in good shape or have potential to be restored, but they're protected in lots of different ways by municipalities, by First Nations, by Parks Canada, but they're not connected. And our project is called the Indigenous-led West Coast Stewardship Corridor. And the corridor goes from, right now, the first phase of the corridor goes from the Seattle Nation right in the bottom, right to the biosphere, the Clackwart biosphere, uh, along the west coast with the idea that it'll be tip to tip into the future uh, and then it will reach out into Alaska and down towards the south so this is going to be a piece of this much bigger corridor and the reason I'm talking about this besides talking about the project because I love talking about it is that we have a steering committee that basically um, looks after doing this corridor and right now this we're working with we're talking to 13 different nations along the corridor to find out how we can all work together to make this happen. How do we make these connections happen? And we we're meet, meeting with the 13 nations as we speak and finding out what the barriers are, what the challenges are, and how we what the opportunities are to work together. But coming back to Chief Planis, Chief Planis is on the steering committee and he's been on it right from the day from when we started looking at, looking at it in 2020. And he has been an amazing leader and really pushing the, his vision forward. And I must say, when we go and talk to these nations and we talk about Chief Planus's words, it really helps us to, to bring forth the ideas. So it's my great pleasure to, uh, to uh, welcome Chief Planus and my great pleasure to work with him on this corridor. Welcome, Chief Planus. To my respected relatives and to each and every one of you, uh, it's great to be here today. I just came from Nanaimo from a SEMS meeting, Communal of Effects Management with uh, Transport Canada and DFO, and there's a number of First Nations there. Uh, I just wanted to just touch on that. I, uh, they wanted me there for the full day, but I feel it was really important to be a part of this. So. They understood we have two other representatives from our nation attending that. So uh, it is uh, well intended by our people. One of the things that I just wanted to start with is uh, when we started talking with the federal government four years ago about the Oceans Protections Plan and the Salish Sea Initiative, uh, they didn't want to include the terrestrial. And uh, we are the salmon people. And being the salmon people from south, the salmon starts from the terrestrial and goes right back to it again. It's the cycle of life. And we can't do a project unless we have our whole territory involved. And that way we can measure it the way it's supposed to be measured, the way our ancestors wanted to, me to measure it. So uh, it took a little bit of uh, uh, discussion, bartering, talking about how we're going to do projects together, but they came around and said, we totally understand. So, you know, government does have their priorities on the way they do things, and they have policies that they have to stick by. And I think uh, if any work's going to be done in our territory, I think uh, uh, the way that uh, works well with us is our indigenous laws, our values are just totally entrenched into the environment. And uh, I think that protective mechanism is a part of what helps us take care of it. And I think if we can incorporate those kind of laws in with the, uh, with the laws in Canada, I think we can start moving towards uh, something that makes a lot more common sense. And that is, is that uh, we're hurting ourselves. And it's a lot of work, but um, you know we need to change that. And we've been doing this for a while now. 
I just want to mention that I'm not going to mention any logging companies. We've been having, you know, before I was elected leader over, forgot how many years ago it was, but uh, the elders uh, always asked me to come to the meetings. And then when I was on council about 20 years ago, I was talking to a person in a logging company. And he said to me, you guys don't go up there anyway, do you? You know, like, in other words, we didn't go up into the land and we, we just stayed close to the water. And it's, and I, you know, maybe 20 years ago it was different. Different times maybe 20 years ago for somebody to say that. And now, with the relationship we have with the logging companies within our territory, that relationship has changed. And that is, is that we can talk at a table about our vision to the future of our territory and how they can assist us in changing it. Now, this is uh, an ongoing work that has been going on, you know, from our elders that are passed away. So what I do at home is just a continuation of the work that is very important to our people. And we're starting to see uh, somewhat of a, a circle effect where we're getting empowered. Uh, we're working at home to enhance our territory. And as we enhance it, I think uh, what is happening is we're, we're able to communicate um, way better than we did before. And I, I need to uh, emphasize that because um, four years ago, I was asked to sit on a federal panel for Canada. And it was called the Indigenous Circle of Experts in regards to tribal parks, uh, uh, Indigenous protected and conservation areas. Uh, uh, Catherine McKenna played the role, the lead role in that. So I've been on that table and still am. And in those discussions across Canada, we went to many, many villages, talked to many elders. Uh, when I came home, I went and had some really good discussions with a local logging company. And we talked about how we can preserve our territory. And uh, just recently, Mosaic has uh, committed to protecting 40,000 hectares of first growth timber. And a thousand of it is going to be in our territory. And we're going to be the first. I'm a part of that table. I'm going to assist in this. And uh, thinking about it, uh, when, I, when I heard the news, I said, well, that's a good start. Because we have a lot more work to do. But I never ever thought that we would be playing a role in protecting first growth timber in our territory. I thought that uh, that is money that the logging companies would like to have in their pocket. And with that is welcoming news, but there's still a lot of work to do with biodiversity. And you, it, uh, I was just up in our territory yesterday. I was up at a place they call Al Alligator. I don't know why they call it alligator, but uh, if you go up by Bear Creek Reservoir and Diversion Dam, and you come over towards Muir Creek, and uh, called Muir Mountain is above it, we call it the Smokehouse Mountains. And uh, that's a really important hunting ground. But what I'm getting at is when I went up there, I almost got stuck, so I'm glad I'm here. Uh, I walked into the forest, and I remember that place because um, 40 to 50 years ago it was logged. And I know because I hunted up there. And also I was a logger in the late 70s. So I know all of that area quite well. And when I walked into the forest, there's nothing living underneath it. It's so sad to think that you can, you, you can plant trees but you don't space them. You don't give biodiversity a chance. And I just, I just went, well, why can't we do something about this? I know it's going to cost a lot of money, but we got to find a way to do something. And, um, you know, talking to politicians, may it be federal, provincial, two municipal mayors, 
and looking at creative ways of tackling issues that nobody wants to tackle. And that is, it's going to cost money. And where are we going to find it? That's the hard part. Are we all going to invest in this? Uh, is it a worthy investment? And I think uh, when you talk to politicians, it's about the next election cycle. We sh need to be looking 100 years ahead. We got to consider a legacy we can leave for our children. You know, our children are not born yet. So just in saying that, standing in the forest yesterday, that's sad. I, I'm sorry to say, but that is really sad that uh, you could go into a forest and harvest it and you can call it a, um, a it ain't actually a, a forest, it's a plantation. So I seen the sign years ago when you're driving the Jordan River and it says plantation. Like, like that's not a very good word because this is a food forest and it should be treated as such. I think if we, uh, you know, we are getting creative and looking at different ways of taking care of the environment. So we talked about ecosystem service fees, you know, all the water that, that everyone drinks on South Vancouver Island comes from our lake, one of our smokehouse lakes. And thinking about all the businesses that rely on that water. And we talked about ecosystem service fees and a way that if we found an investment like even uh, someone that stays in a hotel room or is making, a, you know, maybe it might, might be even a, a brewery, whatever. Uh, if you put in an ecosystem service fee, we could actually hire people to get rid of invasive species on South Vancouver Island. We could get people to spread the trees out so we can let some sunshine in. We could hire people to actually uh, build a business that could make to that could be sustainable and not have to knock trees down so I think that's a good place to go and the reason I say that it means everyone gets involved and at the end of the day we're not all going to be here a hundred years from now maybe a few of you will I don't know but I won't but imagine a hundred years from now and you go to, into a forest and the trees are that big. And guess what? There's a whole bunch of stuff growing underneath it. That's where we gotta go. And uh, we have some work to do, not just on the terrestrial, but of course our whole territory. I've never seen uh, opportunity come to us in light in the last four years than when they decided to build the pipeline. Uh, before that, talking and negotiating was hard because you're trying to enhance your territory and everybody else owns it but us. We live on two small uh, villages, uh, one along Big River, they call Souk River, and I live in the village of Siosin on the open ocean, meaning the sounds the pebbles make when they're being washed up on our shores. And we have a territory and if we can uh, find a way of of enhancing it on a hundred year model. I'm thinking my, uh, my grandson will take on that work. He's only six years old. In 30 years, maybe he will be the elected chief. In 30 years, his hundred year cycle begins. So I think if we really look at it that way, I think we can just start changing the minds of how we do business. Uh, we did go to the province about four or five years ago and asked about putting wind turbines uh, from the south of Vancouver Island, uh, right on the middle of the island. And uh, the province said, no, we're building Site C. Well, that's fine, but it wouldn't be come out of the taxpayer's pocket. Uh, it would totally be funded. The only problem you had with the First Nations is how much destruction are you going to have putting them in? And uh, other 
questions that arose from that is, if we did this, would it mean that we wouldn't have to knock trees down anymore? So those are really good discussions to have. And I had those discussions with EDP Renewables, and I did it in Dallas, Texas, of all places. So, so in saying that, uh, there's new technology, new innovation, all of this stuff that's going to help us in the next 100 years is coming. One of the things I found from the wind turbines is they're going to find a way of putting it in pieces. That way you don't have to rip apart mountains to get it up there. Uh, we had a really unique journey in the last 12 years with our solar voltaic project. And it was kind of funny. We were the biggest one in BC. And it's like, what are we doing? I think we need to wake up and move a little bit faster. And I see it across Canada now where things are starting to pick up. Uh, I was actually invited to a university in, uh, outside Amsterdam about four years ago to talk about kite power. Believe it or not, kite power. Is it feasible? Well, there's a lot of countries out there doing it right now. And we partnered up with a company out of Switzerland. It's in its infancy, but solar panels were in their infancy one day. Now look at the changes. So we looked into accumulated ocean energy. We just dabbled in it, see if it's feasible. Mother Nature will rip apart anything you want. So whatever you do, you're going to pay a big price for it. So we're trying to uh, find ways for us to be sow. We just need to be sow. And how are we going to do it? We need to protect the environment and enhance it. And we have to bring our language back because Sinchothan language takes care of the environment. And our, langu our language follows the salmon root. And it mimics the branches when they're making noise in the forest, when the water is dropping off the trees, when the streams are or with water are going by. That's where our language came from. And I think the more people that can learn uh, indigenous languages, um, that will help the planet. And I don't know if that's possible, but I think around the world that is happening right now. And I think as a collective, um, Mother Earth needs some help. And we're all trying to find ways of helping Mother Earth. And the crest I have here is uh, Tamach, and it means Mother Earth. It's a treaty process we've been in in over 20 years. And uh, we are getting creative at home on how we can um, find ways to protect the environment and our territory without compromising jobs. How do you do that? Anybody know how to do that? Uh, it's really hard to do. So in the future, we're going to have to uh, ask ourselves some really hard questions. Is what do we give up? And it's, and it's, it's going to be really hard. And for us in our small community, I'll, I'll, I'll get off the floor here because I know I'm taking up too much time. But uh, in our small community of South, we had about 150 people that came to our village on Aboriginal Day. Our premier, John Horgan, came out. And um, it, was, it was really something to see because the bear and the cub walked by when we were having dances right beside the mouth of the river. And right above it, us, an eagle was flying over. And everybody was so happy. And, um, and, and, and you can take from this what you want. Uh, our ancestors were there. And they showed us that they were there. And that's the way our people think. And how is that? It's because our communication goes differently. It doesn't go with the internet or the telephone. The creator brought the bear and the eagle to us that day with a little baby cub. And they just spoke to us. So uh, that's really important. I, um, as you can see, I did not acknowledge Songhees. 
part of the territory, the Wasanich are here as well, is because I am Songhees. My uh, grandmother was born in Songhees, Caroline. And my uh, great aunt, uh, she, uh, she comes from Sartlip. I have relatives in Sayo through my dad's side. And uh, my name, uh, Hayakwachi, is named after hereditary chief of Chiano, the salmon people. And it's handed down. And everyone asks me, what does that word mean? It's hereditary chief's name. And if you carry that, uh, you need to hand it down to your children when it's time. So uh, with that, I want to uh, thank you for allowing me some time to come up here and just say a few words about our territory and the work we're trying to do at home to enhance it. We have a lot of work to do. I've seen the changes in the last 20 years being a part of uh, chief and council. And, um, you know, I'm looking for the younger people to step up and say, it's your turn. Get in here. But we have to do business differently now. And, and that's the hard part is is when you're doing this work everybody thinks about the dollar bill first we need to think about the environment first that should be number one and we don't and that's a problem because we we do four things within our community that are that the community uh, uh, all came together and said Number one is uh, food security within the territory and within the village. Uh, energy security and so many different shapes and form. And the other one is the building of our culture because it'll, it'll protect our territory. And the last, four, the last thing we do, the fourth thing, economic development. So economic development it's fourth and it's not first. I think we need to go there. Can we do it? I don't know. I think if we got enough people together, we can figure it out. So thank you very much. Hushka, Hushka, see ya. Thank you very much for your, uh, your words, Chief Planas. Very much appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to today's workshop. It's been uh, fascinating so far. This is the panel discussion, and it's going to go on for about 45 minutes from, uh, is that, no, pardon me. Uh, from 2.35 till about 3 o'clock. And then we'll have our uh, brainstorming sessions from 3 o'clock to 3.45, followed by an abbreviated reporting out. And uh, then the day will be wrapped up by 4 o'clock this afternoon. Our panel this afternoon, we've heard uh, stimulating presentations from all three of them this morning. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, Lauren Eckert, closest to me, Chief Gordon Planas, and Deborah Curran. And uh, uh, I, am going, I have a couple of questions that I thought we might use to get them started. And I'm guessing at that point I'll simply have to hand them the microphone and they'll be riffing off each other until I tell them it's time to stop. So we'll start off that way. Uh, maybe uh, we'll start at the far end with Deborah Curran. Uh, Deborah, the majority of the land in the coastal Douglas Fir and coastal Western Hemlock drier zones is in private ownership. What limitations does this pose in terms of municipal policy and what can we be doing better? You've, you've covered uh, some of this in your presentation this morning. I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Um, I am a, a private landowner in the colonial system. Uh, I also have read a lot of municipal law from across Canada and I espouse a view that is not very popular with private landowners and that is 
Uh, the Courts of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada in here in the country that we live in have said that extensive land use restrictions are the norm. That landowners need to accept restrictions in the public interest. And this is not a view that we get from the United States. So a lot of the language that is used around um, uh, private property rights and the protection of private property rights and I can do whatever I want with my property uh, comes from a US perspective which they have an amendment to their constitution that actually uh, requires compensation by the government for any change in land value when a regulation is imposed. We simply don't have that in Canada. So if the government does take property, they need to compensate it. But we don't have any instances of a regulatory expropriation in a land use context. So we do if the government creates a park and it basically erases logging entitlements or mining entitlements, then compensation is owed. But in a private property sense, if I'm able to subdivide my property and create 10 lots, and then suddenly the government changes the zoning and I can no longer do that, my land value is going to decrease and I am not owed any compensation. And this is also made very clear in the Local Government Act because there is a section that says there is no compensation owed for a change in land value due to the uh, issuance of a permit or the enactment of a land use bylaw. So I just want to set out that context because I think it provides sort of the Canadian approach to what it is we're doing here with private land, which, you know, we could go into a conversation about the meaning of private land in the context of Indigenous rights and, uh, and what that could mean. But if we're talking about purely about local government bylaws and a collective sense of ecosystem function, it's very clearly in the public interest to maintain ecosystem function, and that includes ecosystem function throughout private landscapes. And so when we have environmental development permit areas or riparian connectivity or protection, if you actually read the sections of the Local Government Act, and I would encourage you to go and do that, um, you can, if you have an environmental development permit area, you can prohibit development. You can set aside natural features. You can require dedication of water courses to the local government. So these are very uh, strong powers that are pro-environment, pro-collective sense of what we're doing here together. And so this is what we talk about creating a culture of conservation. Um, we, there, is no, there are no private property rights in the sense of you are entitled to do whatever you want with your property. It is connected to a larger whole. And that larger whole is not just causing no harm to someone else. It's actually also maintaining what the community has identified as the public interest, which includes then uh, ecological function. So there's a whole lot we can do. I can, you know, it's pretty boring to talk about the specifics of individual bylaws. I would refer you to the Green Bylaws Toolkit, but there is, I've given you some language that is very strongly pro-environment that local governments can use to create c connectivity corridors on private property, to require restoration as part of development permitting, to prohibit the cutting of trees unless certain things happen or in favor of moving towards a broader biodiversity standard that the local government or the community has identified um, itself. Thank you. Uh, Chief Planus, I was, uh, I was struck by the priorities that your nation that your communities had established and how the economic development was uh, number four on the list underneath uh, protection and restoration of the environment and the culture. And this is, um, this is very different from the priorities that I've heard some other communities uh, uh, establish for their communities. And I'm wondering if, if you 
have some ideas, some explanations about why your nation and your community would have established priorities uh, so differently, apparently, from other communities? Um, how can I uh, explain that? Uh, we live on the res. It's totally different than anywhere else. We do things differently than other people because we live in as, as a collective on a piece of land uh, put there by the federal government. But we have our own culture within. All of my brothers and sisters live around me. And uh, when you think about that in that context, uh, when, we, uh, when we have meetings and talk amongst ourselves, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, what kind of economic development projects do you want to do? Members will say, well, I, I, want, a, I want a fuel station so I can get cheaper gas. Uh, and also a place where I can buy my cigarettes. And it's true. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so we built a Tim Hortons and a Petra can. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and also with our, um, you know, you just think about it. Uh, instead of doing an, uh, an economic development project, we built solar panels instead. And uh, that was fun. We did it for our children. We didn't do it for economic gain. Uh, it's great because we're able to communicate with so many different people, not only in Canada, but around the world. And we're able to visit different countries and, and uh, compare notes. And uh, for, our, for our small community, it's, it's like uh, all of the resources that were taken from our territory the last hundred years, uh, how do we bring it back? And because uh, we know if we do that, we'll have a strong, strong, stronger culture. So how do we do that? And uh, so the focus is different. Uh, you, when you think about it, uh, we live on, a, on the res, but at the same time, we have a big territory. And in that territory, uh, it's out of balance. So that is the priority, is to bring it back into balance. Well, what does that mean? Well, we have to change what we're doing. And so uh, when we're working on the res, the, the, um, the focus is, is how do we, how do we do something that is, is challenging and how do we change the minds of people? And um, it's working that we are starting to see change. And I think that's really important because uh, it ain't just our people that are creating that change. It's everyone's creating that change. So um, I, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Um, I did go up in the hills last week to a, a certain place and I, was, I, I brought up some people there and I just, I said, you know, this whole valley was full of great big fir trees and they logged it in the 70s. Imagine how old those fir trees were and imagine what it'd be like to try and get it back that way. So uh, um, those are really important discussions to have because um, our house is, is in our territory, we actually have 20 houses. And they're up by the Smokehouse Lakes, they're by the rivers, they're everywhere. So they're not just in a, in a, in a longhouse, it's, it, your house can be in, in a canoe. So uh, you have to look at it differently. Thank you, Chief Planas. Um, Lauren, what, what is the ecology of fear and why is it important? I can absolutely speak to this one. I'll be the uh, ecologist version of my conservation scientist self in this moment. Um, so the ecology of fear, I think, sits nested really well within this conversation about interconnectivity that we've all been having, that each of us impacts the other, whether human animal or non-human animal. And when I was first introduced to the ecology of fear, it was in the Upper Peninsula of the US. 
uh, at a field course and we were talking about the overabundance of deer and other ungulates in that area of the world and using the classic and sometimes controversial example of Yellowstone, we walked through how the presence of carnivores can foundationally change an ecosystem where those carnivores had been removed, artificially removed, in ways that ecologists, Western science-based ecologists, never anticipated. And that was owed not just to the fact that those predators control the population of ungulates, deer, and other hoofed animals, but also that those deer and other animals change their behavior in a landscape where predators are present. And those behavior changes actually resulted in changes up and down the ecosystem. So changes to plantation, to vegetation, to biodiversity of plants, and then in turn to river systems and to probably all sorts of things we are yet to fully understand. So this ecology of fear in the landscape means that in a landscape where we don't have predators, where we don't have carnivores, all other animals in that ecosystem are directly impacted, directly or indirectly impacted, and not just because of the number of prey that those predators take from a system. So I think it's this really beautiful expression of uh, the inter inherent interconnectivity and the ways, I think especially in a Western framework, a Western knowledge framework, we often are, we can be reductionist in thinking about how things change. And we can think if we remove wolves, we'll have more deer, so we can just have people come in and take more deer. But in fact, much more changes than just the number of deer left in an ecosystem. So I think it speaks to the hubris of uh, Western management systems that we thought uh, we could control and anticipate all of the changes. And I'll just add really quickly, that I was recently in discussion with someone talking about black bears and people, uh, and in fact talking about grizzly bears, because where I live, we rarely see grizzly bears, but this spring we had two in town, and that caused a lot of social fear uh, in the community. And I had someone talk about the ecology of fear as it applies to humans. So how human animals operate differently in the context of uh, carnivores or omnivores, as is the case of bears, that we're not familiar with. And it was a good reminder that, of course, along with every other ecological theory, uh, the ecology of fear applies to human animals too. Our behavioral ecology is shaped by the other animals that we uh, share our homes with and how we feel about them if we are fearful of them. So I could talk all day about the ecology of fear and I will hand it back. Thank you. Now we're fortunate to have this extraordinary panel here for another 10 minutes or so. Are there questions that uh, people here want to ask? Uh, one, two, three. Let's uh, start up with the first hand that was up even before I asked here. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. So, um, Yes, I was involved in a grassroots campaign about starting about 30 years ago, along with many people from the community to create a C to C green belt stretching all the way from South Salt Spring all the way down to Soup Basin. The campaign was protect uh, was supported by um, Fred, uh, sorry Frank Planis, um, and he did talk about the Smokehouse Lakes at that time, and it was supported throughout the region by all levels of government, um, and ultimately has been a tremendous success in terms of connectivity on the things that have been raised here. My concern and my question is uh, very much related to the impacts of uh, housing development and uh, recreation on this remarkable achievement which is now being destroyed it, for instance Mount Wells and other areas in the Souk Hills Wilderness Regional Park have intensive development hard up against their boundaries I want to know what I can do now as a campaigner to at the municipal level to um, to 
create buffers on the edge of our parks, some sort of zoning that actually prohibits these kind of hard developments right up against which have enormous impacts in so many levels uh, on the protected areas, um, both visual, uh, the acoustics, the, the, the changes to climate you know, within the parks, everything, domestic animals. So I, I, I want some, I want, I'd like to hear people speak to that. And the other piece of it is uh, the, the recreation area within the parks. What can we do to stop? Uh, again, I think perhaps if we have buffers on the edge of the parks, then some of these heavy recreational activities like mountain biking and um, other activities that have such an impact on wildlife could be I mean, this could be a solution to both things, and I'd just like to hear what people think we can do because these are municipal zoning issues. So that's my question. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, yeah, I mentioned my Uncle Frank. His name's Kwakwaiach, he's a hereditary chief in South. Um, we manage the campground up at Spring Salmon Place. We call it Kla'echin. Uh, my grandmother said it's the place where the spring salmon give themselves back to Mother Earth. And uh, when we go up there, uh, you have a park on one side of the river and the other side is held by a private interest logging company. And, I've, and I uh, mentioned this to people living in Souk doesn't make sense to have a park on one side and a bunch of condos on the other. And, uh, and that would be a, a sad day because we're trying to protect the salmon and the watershed. So uh, looking at the area across the river, um, I used to go there and, and watch the bear all the time. He would, uh, they had a logging road that went halfway up the mountain and I'd go up there and and uh, we just watched the bears and and then they built a road right to the top and um, and they were ready to log it and i asked them respectfully not to log it because it doesn't make sense the trees are so small up there and uh, why do you need to you know you have to ask those questions why do you have to but they didn't log it and that's good and that was about four years ago so the other concern now is we've got to find money to buy it <laughs> because, you know, there, it's ready to be logged. And uh, uh, I think that whole area is so important. And it is within the municipal boundaries. So uh, it should be a protected area. Uh, we should be looking at the watersheds as a whole and not just along the river, but every uh, river uh, is important in our territory. So we, as a collective, have to take a look at all the territory and see where it flows. Our territory is where the water flows. So the heart of the territory is uh, the Souk Lake. And uh, there's so many important places up there. And if you ever heard the name Jordan Meadows, that's right off the, the CRD, bought a big swath of land and they're protecting it and it's all spongy it's that really nice soft ground um, it's beautiful up there and it's great to see that uh, that ecosystem is going to be uh, protected and if you if you need to know about the environment up there you have to remember those 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 teachings from our from our ancestors and i was very lucky to um, probably about 30, 40 years ago up by Prayer Creek Reservoir that I witnessed um, about 100 deer going up a mountain. And you'll never see that ever again. I've never seen it again. But imagine that many deer, like bucks and does and, and fawns and everything going over a mountain. And it's like, wow, now we have to, um, I said earlier, I, I went into the forest and it was dark and it was nothing's living in there. So, so again, so again, there's this, uh, 
ecosystem that is, is, is threatened, and I think we all have to see it. Yeah, I'll have to go up there and take a look in that forest, just so you can see it for yourself. Um, the the private managed forest lands is is one thing that I'm not going to touch on. So there's lots of critique out there about the PMFLA and how it doesn't come near our public forest management, and it's it's a problem in and of itself. So that's another conversation. But if we're talking purely within local government jurisdiction, perhaps it's time to renew the green blue spaces strategy. So the green blue spaces strategy was the original basis, the ecological basis of our regional growth strategy back in the late 90s. And it was created in partnership by the conservation community and by the CRD. So perhaps this time it would be created uh, in partnership between the indigenous communities in the CRD, the CRD and in conversation as the two authority holders, governments then or multiple governments and then uh, in conversation with the conservation community. And it would be time to update that. So as you pointed out, the, the C2C Greenbelt was a big success. And so then how do we then modernize it such that we take a more fine grained approach to improving the biodiversity and ecological importance or health of those areas. And there's been a lot of work done on buffer zones for agricultural land. So you can establish a development permit area for the protection of agriculture and create buffer zones. You could do that as well around parks. You could create EDPAs, environmental development permit areas, on the private land side as the buffer zones for the park. So the conservation aspect of it, like the buffer, has to be on the private land, which would mean having buildings farther away from the, you know, the back of the lot, if that's what's, what's touching the parkland. It could be, there could be berming between the parkland and the private land. There could be other kinds of barriers that have to occur. And I don't mean hard barriers, but I mean sort of my ecological barriers such that then the urban use doesn't flow into the, um, into the park use. Uh, the other way to do it is through zoning. So zoning around parkland, doing it differently than just chopping it up into sort of rational pieces as we do a 50 by 100 foot lot. And so the zoning pieces, there should be policies within an OCP saying around these large pieces of parkland, the kind of zoning upon subdivision will include and then it would be larger parcels where, again, the, any built part of it will be uh, farthest away from, their, uh, from the park. There might be prohibitions on um, actual where development can occur and covenanting on the private, law, the private land side to prohibit development, for example, 20 meters or 30 meters into those, um, into those private pieces of private land. And the, the District of the Highlands has done that nicely in some of their subdivisions. So there's examples of that where they have allowed cluster zoning. So there's been a significant amount of protection of a larger parcel. They've allowed sort of densification and cluster zoning for the density along one aspect of it. And then there's, there are covenants on the private land side prohibiting development a certain amount or a certain uh, portion in. They've also, uh, they've also done reversed covenants, meaning they've established where you can put any built infrastructure on the lot and otherwise you can't have any development on the lot. So they've actually covenanted the footprint of where you can have a building and then nothing is allowed otherwise. So these are all live examples that are well done and it could be then through a blue and green spaces strategy that then this is then communicated from a regional scale then out to municipalities along with citizen advocacy. Thank you. I know we're at time, so I will try and make this quick. <laughs> um, thank you for the question, and I, I'm afraid my thoughts will be far less practical uh, and applied than Deborah's. Um, but I, I just want to add a couple thoughts to the discussion. Uh, as a young-ish person, I've, I feel, you know, compelled to add that when it comes to housing developments, like we are living in a time of real housing availability crisis. 
and luxury condos don't fix that problem by any means. Um, but as a person privileged in a bunch of ways, you know, I personally have struggled mightily to manage to find remotely affordable, safe housing. And so in tandem of talking about conservation and protection, I think it's important to remember we also unfortunately have to grapple with um, human needs in terms of, of development and housing. And in addition to that, the recreation piece on, on modernly called Mount Wells, one of the ways I fell in love with Victoria when I first moved here was, was rock climbing in the area. And people come to the conversation of conservation in many, many different ways. And many people come to that conversation, it's hard saying that, and conservation over and over. Um, but because of their experiences, mountain biking, climbing, recreating in, in beautiful places, we are lucky to be exposed to. And uh, one approach to conservation is protection and preservation. But I think uh, settler descendant folks, Western minded folks in particular, have an opportunity to learn from, you know, what Chief Planis was saying about his community's priorities in reimagining not how we can exclude people from places, but instead how we can include people in new ways in those places. And so how can we balance the needs of housing in Greater Victoria uh, with the needs of bears and, you know, birds and, ungulates and plants and fungi and all of these things uh, in an area like Mount Wells. And so I think uh, I, I offer no solutions and no answers to those questions, but I just invite everyone to think about protected areas in a way that includes humans, because we are also animals who need these places for our very survival and our sort of emotional uh, connection as well. So I always want to make sure we're keeping people in part of the conversation when we talk about protecting these areas, even though we are often the problem as well. So thanks. We cannot understand the relationship, say, for example, between predator and prey without understanding the broader relationships that co-evolved with these other animals. And what I mean by that is the participation of humans in the ecologies of these landscapes since time immemorial. So human-wildlife conflict occurs when an action by either humans or wildlife has an adverse effect on the other. However, this term is problematic um, as it does suggest that wildlife are conscious human antagonists. So researchers like Redpath et al. 2012 partitioned such conflicts into their two components. One being the impacts that deal with the direct interactions be between humans and other species. And two, the conflicts that center on human interactions between those seeking to conserve species and those with other goals. With that hierarchy, you know, often people's pets and dogs will get to have this privilege of chasing all the animals off of a beach while the seagulls and the birds are trying to feed. And that hierarchy is really damaging. There is no hierarchy of he, she, and it in Tlaokwait language. The suffix that we have or the, um, the pronoun that we have is ish, which is all they, they, it's a singular they. So the tree is an individual, the rock is an individual, even the plants are individuals, the bear is an individual. So even in English, as I've been learning language for the last um, 12 years now, and thinking about these things, when I see bears, um, when I think about wolves, or cougars, I try my best to take out that language of it and othering and refer to them as they, as they are in our own language. As the bears, since they're very picky eaters, they tend to eat the eggs and the really delicious parts of, of the salmon first and leave the head and tail and guts um, on, on the grass. So between that and their urine and feces, it leads to an enormous um, proliferation of flies. So imagine salmon carcasses writhing with maggots that eventually become flies. Uh, and of course, these flies then 
uh, become food in turn for insectivores such as the Pacific wren. So like in the bottom uh, corner here, this would be a, a late sort of landscape where the, the chunks in those, um, in that, in that opening are all islands of refugia and all those fungi and then, and a lot of other things like lichens and birds and great things are are able to persist in that landscape in these refugia and then and then um migrate out into the into the regenerating forest over time so you, you're kind of keeping things in in the landscape and hopefully they recover because they're right at the edge of the range so the populations they're going to provide the individuals that are going to move first with climate change and this is really important this is one of the really great reasons why the coastal Douglas fir zone is so important. We have these species that are primed to move as um, climate change uh, forces them to move northward and pole or poleward and upward. So four years before uh, the death of, of forests across these 48 years, um, the average conditions were actually pretty much wetter and cooler. Precipitation was normal, but the rest of these metrics are in the blue, right? Three and two years prior, things are pretty average. But a year before the mortality year, um, we see for the first time all six of these climate metrics in agreement uh, in the same direction towards warmer and drier. And the mortality year, which I'll go to next, is when this kind of reaches its maximum. Well, our land use has changed as a result of the exclusion of fire. And we see the Gary Oak Meadows filling in. We see here an aerial photograph showing an infilling of forest into those areas and a shift then towards closed canopy forests um, and green spaces that today have a very different species composition, ecosystem function, and as our climate warms, and as we've experienced in recent years, increasing susceptibility to fire. You have to think over long time frames. You have to think at big scales. You have to think parts and processes. You have to look at what nature is doing and try to mimic that as best you can maintain connectivity maintain the integrity of these systems that is a whole different way of thinking than we do now of looking at trees and forests it's a very different way of thinking and we're really working hard to shift our paradigm right now as a result of decreased movement in the human dominated land matrix protected areas and the animal populations they contain can become isolated and the flow of these vital ecological and evolutionary processes can become critically impaired and grind to a halt. So in this case, we ended up developing a resistance layer. And so the human footprint I just talked about is a very major component of that, uh, but it also takes land cover and slope into account. So you can consider how you know really steep slopes and snow and glacier covered areas are generally more difficult to traverse. To achieve large landscape transboundary resilience, we need a formal governance structure to ensure equitable and effective decision-making, resource sharing, and cooperative management across the region. And this needs to be codified within an appropriate transboundary agreement so that this work has the authority and the legitimacy of cooperative governance, governance efforts. So when we know where people and animals go, we can predict areas where conflict might occur. These evidence-based predictions are crucial to identifying and mitigating the effects of recreation on wildlife populations. And of course, we don't expect a, a simple, uh, consistent or uniform response across different species. We might expect different species to respond in different ways. Uh, uh, some might be attracted to, to people for, for food subsidies or other things. Others might be more sensitive and might in fact drop out of areas that have high levels of recreation. When we talk about encounters, we talk a lot about trying to understand what the bear is going to do next. But my point is that you might not be able to predict the bear's response because the bear is an individual with a lot of previous experience too. You can definitely predict your response because, well, you're in your own head, obviously. Uh, the earnest and informed discussions that were taking place if the other discussions were half as good as the ones in our group, I'm sure we'll have lots of valuable input uh, for uh, people making decisions about this beautiful part of the world. And so to wrap up our afternoon, I'm going to hand the microphone back to uh, Shauna Dahl, one of our organizers here. Um, I think, will you be drawing the valuable prizes also, Shauna? Very exciting. For those who 
stick around right till the end, which should be about 12 minutes from now. Okay, so I just, I'm going to wrap up with some thanks to all of the folks who made this possible today. A big thank you to Deborah Curran and Lauren Eckert and also Chief Planis for being here today. Um, the, all of the expertise shared today was so invaluable and thanks to Andy McKinnon. You will continue to show up for Rain Coast in a lot of big ways and we really appreciate having your support. Um, also, a big shout out is owed to UBC's Community University Engagement Fund. They generously provided the uh, funding that allowed this whole series to happen and will continue to support us mobilizing the discussions that we had here today. And Stream of Consciousness also for broadcasting this and for supporting us and doing a lot of planning and helping us sort through the chaos that was the setup this morning. Um, and just many thanks to all the presenters who've made Project Teach such an amazing educational asset, and that's sure to be valuable for many years to come. All of those recordings are available online, and this session will also be available online for people to check back to. Um, and then finally, to all my fellow collaborators, Cole Burton of UBC's Wildlife Coexistence Lab for showing up for us as a presenter, as a facilitator today, and in many other forms over the course of the many months that we've been planning this. Nithya Harris, Alistair Craighead, and Allison Spriggs from Coexisting with Carnivores Alliance, Chris Dermont from UVic's Applied Conservation Science Lab, and Persia Khan, Alex Harris, and Emily Lambert from Raincoast, who all have contributed to this. Uh, it's been just a really incredible team who've put all this together. Um, so I just want to, can we have like a round of applause for all these people that <laughs> brought this together? <laughs> And thank you to all of you who came out and uh, contributed to today. Um, this has been for the wild places and the wildlife that call this place home. So I really appreciate that this amazing community of engaged people have decided to take out three hours of their afternoon to have these discussions. My heartfelt thanks to all of you. Um, all the notes that have been collected here today, if you didn't record them on your big posters, uh, if you have them in a notebook, rip them out, give them to me, I'm, those will be mobilized into a report that we're going to deliver to policymakers. And we'll probably also send out a survey for people to add any additional comments, thoughts, anything else. And those webinars that we have recorded will be a great resource for developing those answers if you want to continue to think about these questions. Um, so with all of that said, uh, we're going to wrap up Project Teach Solution Session. So thanks for being here, and we'll do the we'll do the raffle prize after we shut off the camera, so that those folks don't get sad that they didn't win. <laughs> thanks, everybody. <laughs>